My name's Sakari, and it's said Sukari, except in London they say Sakari. And um, my surname is Douglas Camp. I'm a sculptor, and I've been a practicing artist for nearly 27 years, I think, quite a long time. And I live in South East London like you do, and I'm happy to be here. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm happy to be here. Thank you very much for having me as well. <laughs> and thank you for the cake. <laughs> <laughs>my studio and welcome to another edition of Art Success with me Adelaide Damara. Today I'm so excited because I had the privilege of interviewing a lady who needs little to no introduction, the wonderful Sakari Douglas Camp. You're currently represented by October Gallery, am I correct? I actually, I, I don't know if I am um, currently represented <laughs> by the October Gallery but I have shown with them recently and mm -hmm. they seem to be representing me which is really sweet of them actually you know we haven't really signed a contract or anything oh i see yeah and how did that relationship come about i showed at the october gallery about 27 years ago so i showed with them when they weren't really um that well known mm. and so i've known them for years and i chose not to show with them for a while um Basically, because I had other places that I wanted to be shown. Yeah. Yeah. And in my career, as in your first question, you ask about um, the Stux Gallery, Stefan Stux Gallery in New York. I was represented by them and we did sign a contract, but um, recently they died, as you saw. They're no longer a physical gallery. So all the work that I had with them is now back in England, which is rather terrifying. I have shown with the Red Fern, which was a very kind of um, special gallery at one time because the aim of artists 27, 25 years ago was to show in Cork Street. Yeah. And the Red Fern was in Cork Street. And, you know, if you had a contract with them, it was like you were made. And um, But unfortunately, I just found that what they weren't um, what I needed. I needed to be exhibited in lots of places. You know, I just didn't want to hide with one gallery and, and wait for them every two years to show me. I couldn't see how I could help with running my house yeah. and stuff <laughs> with a contract like that. So I ran off and I discovered that I did residencies. <coughs> I um, did commissions, I went in for competitions and you know I was the first resident um, artist at the Africa Centre yeah. and I showed at the Smithsonian so I had conversations with museums first in my career before I got to galleries. Galleries is more kind of my mid-career rather than the beginning of me. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, it's different. Yeah, it is definitely different because so many artists strive um, for that thing of being represented by a gallery and, and the museum usually comes later. Well, it depends what era you're in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in the dark ages, um, museums were very, very inventive. Um, museums got excited by contemporary artists because um, I guess they had funding, whilst galleries um, really hadn't got into the swing of um, an awful lot of money, I guess, from government anyway. And the places like the Smithsonian opened their um, Museum of African Art, and my exhibition opened that, you know, and that was in 1988, 89 and um, they were given money by the government. Museums wanted to enliven the objects that they had um, just because, I guess, you know, you, you get to a, a pitch in collecting and there's almost no more to be collected. So curators and people had the idea that if you had contemporary artists in, it would kind of enliven yeah. the museum conversation. And <coughs> my work at the time was trying to um, enliven masks, as they call it, masks, 
But the thing is, Kalabari, which is what I am, I'm from the Niger Delta in Nigeria, and my people are called Kalabari. And we actually wear masks on top of our heads. Okay. So this business of having a mask on a wall facing you never made that much sense to me anyway. Um, and also, I felt as a, a kind of young African, why the hell were these things on the wall when in context they would be on somebody? And if you see a mask properly dressed, you know, the excitement of um, seeing that is more exciting than anything the Western world had on offer, apart from, I guess, theatre and ballet and everything else. That edition of African performance just hadn't been exploited at the time. Mm. So I made figures like this one. <coughs> um, this is, um, what's it called? Flying Fish, this piece is called. It's actually privately owned by somebody, but they couldn't put it in their offices, so it's here. <laughs> And it's been here for quite a few years. <laughs> so I, I <clears throat> enlivened the idea of masquerading and the idea of, um, you know, an exhibition of Calabari culture, I guess. Um, and that was the start of my career. Amazing. Yeah. But uh, how did the thing with the Smithsonian come about? They saw something I did at the Africa Centre. I see. I was resident artist at the Africa Centre. Yeah. And I got a huge grant and I worked for about a year or so making artworks. Then what I did was that I got this grant and I went off to Nigeria and I picked up about 70 new performers in my village and I brought them to London wow. as an end piece for my work. Because people kept on saying you know, that you know, was, were these kind of weird masquerade creatures that I made out of my imagination? I said, no, they're not. They're something that I see and enjoy, and there are aspects of the costume and things that really tickle my fancy as an artist. Yeah. So I've chosen to explore this. Okay? So um, I brought the actual dancers, and <coughs> we used the physical station of the Africa Centre as a kind of shrine, and then from there, we, um, I set up an exhibition of my work. And there was a sort of 20 foot boat there, um, masquerade pieces dressed in costumes like that, and um, some kinetic pieces that you know, danced like the masqueraders mm -hmm. and drummers that drummed away. My sister at the time, tying up ghillie head ties for people to come and wear and buy. So we went from the Africa Centre that was sort of used as a shrine and we walked to the main kind of piazza and we used that as the town square. And so the performers that came, you know, there was a drummer in, um, in the kind of rear of a church that backs onto, um, you know, Covent Garden piazza. Mm -hmm. And um, so the drummers were ensconced there and um, the echo and the sound was really wonderful. And then these um, dancers <laughs> trotting around the piazza as if they were in my village, really. <laughs> and it was the most surreal thing, the most surreal event. And they kind of did performances in Battersea, outside the Commonwealth Institute, or whatever it was called at the time, off um, Kensington High Street and they performed in different places and people saw these costumed folk and it was just thrilling for me as an artist um, just to have these people step on the soil here was fantastic. What's been your, your biggest challenge to date as an artist and, and how did you overcome it? My biggest challenge is keeping going and um, trying to understand what I need to do um, and trying to be as inventive as I, I can, really. Mm -hmm. Targeting where my work will thrive, too, is a hard thing. And, you know, now that I'm sort of nearly 60 or whatever, I'm trying to think of um, where, where to put my work so that I don't drown in my house and studio. <laughs> um, yeah, so those are the challenges. Have you been conscious of any uh, racial or gender bias so far in your career? And, and if so, how have you moved past that? 
it's a, a, a bit of a peculiar question, really, um, because everybody has challenges, you know, and they're black, white, green. And to add to that, you know, I'm female as well, so... You what? What are you asking? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, I think that, you know, these challenges or whatever you asking about, um, I use them to my advantage. Yeah, because, you know, I come from Nigeria, I mean, you know, and um, everyone always thinks that wherever they come from is best, you know, <laughs> like you think your mum is the best mum in the world or whatever. So I grew up with that thought and I couldn't think of anything better than sort of studying bits and pieces that excited me about my culture. Um, so, in that sense, being black or being Nigerian, I've used to my advantage. I've really nurtured it in my life. And the other thing is that, um, you know, being female too, I think I kind of nurtured in the strangest way because here I am and I'm sitting in overalls or whatever because, you know, this is my working kit. But it's the fact that I'm probably a woman that I've I'm wearing this, you know, because um, I'm very sensible, <laughs> very aware of health and safety, and, um, you know, very aware of what I want to do, and that is um, well to my work, <laughs> whether it's, um, you know, um, considered a male thing or not, that had absolutely nothing to do with what was in my head, what um, had to do with my thoughts about um, the work I wanted to do was the fact that, you know, the strength of steel is, is fantastic. fantastic. It's tensile strength. It's incredible. And as, as an artist, I could see that I could use this in all sorts of ways that was rather female. And um, because, you know, I appreciate its delicacy and the fact that some delicate little kind of um, tiny bit of steel could hold up something gigantic. Really tickled me, you know. And um, I just kind of built on that. And I choose to describe um, fabric in my work. But, you know, I choose to describe fabric by making patterns in steel and, you know, dressing my figures as a girl would. You know, you dress a doll you always have, yeah. and I, I don't know why females do that. I mean, some boys do as well. <laughs> so, but, you know, it's something that's predominantly female, supposed to be, is this business of dressing. And I've sort of taken that to another level, I guess. Because, um, you know, I, I like sort of um, architecture and things as well. So the, the very fact of building and dressing is something to do with my work. So... None of it has been a disadvantage. Yeah, yeah. I can see that in the work. Mm. And then there's obviously the fact that um, what we were discussing earlier about the Calabari... Am I saying it correctly? Calabari. Calaba Calabari. Yes. Okay, Calabari people. Um, women are not supposed to sculpt. No. But you've turned that around and, like you say, used it to your advantage. Yes. And you sculpt in steel. Yeah. Well, I mean, Calabari women weren't meant to sculpt because... <clears throat> In our culture, there isn't the word for art, um, but there's a, there's the word for magic and creation and stuff like that. But it's not art as um, Westerners know it, I suppose. And we used to have special carvings that were done that were called Luang Fubra, which is um, figures that um, depict our ancestors to be remembered at certain stages in their careers or whatever. I mean, you know. We had chiefs that would be sculpted, little effigies would be made of them, and then they'd have their sons beside them on the top frame of these sculptures, or screens they were called. Um, there would be heads of people that they'd you know, conquered or actually killed, and this would be like a snapshot, excuse me, of this person's power. That creation, that Luang Fubra is an encasement of magic, of power. And so, you know, the carver is is not 
just an artist. He is like a, a, sh a shaman. Yeah. So women, because they menstruate, can damage um, this kind of power that men get together, um, which makes me laugh because you just think, okay, that means these women are pretty darn powerful as well, you know. If just because they naturally bleed, they can just obliterate any power <laughs> and enhance them. So um, there's all of that that is in me, is that I'm quite respectful of my culture, but I also know my worth. You know, so yes, there is a rule that Kalawai women shouldn't make objects, but even men that made these objects... Um, there were rules as to how you would make a Dwayne Fubra, especially because if you made one that was kind of too naturalistic, um, it was said that this would come to life. Oh. Yeah, so they had this belief that these things would come to life. And if you look into British Museum books or whatever, there's a book on Dwayne Fubra written by Nigel Barley. Um, quite an interesting man. And... Um, you will see that there's Dwayne Fubra that looks like this, <laughs> as if the people didn't know how to carve naturalistically because the kind of face isn't soft or mm. natural in any way. And it's like that for a reason because they believe that these things would come to life. But that's the difference between Calabari culture and I suppose European culture where here we're going after naturalism or trying to make something look as if it could breathe. And over there, I came from a culture that was trying to kind of make it as wooden as possible so it wouldn't come to life. Yeah, so yeah. Um, my era of artists, there's, you know, Damien Hirst almost trying to be God and myself on the way on the other side trying to say, OK, I'm not going to go that, that way because I, I don't want to have that conversation. Oh, I don't want to, you know, challenge God or whatever. So... There's kind of um, two different kind of uh, styles going on and rules going on in my life. And um, I pick quite carefully in that um, I, I didn't want to offend the gods or whatever. You know, I do respect all of that, but I also realised very fully that I want to be an artist. And being an artist, you, you have to make hard cultural choices I suppose um, especially if you have a culture to tackle like yeah. my Kalawari culture and you know there's uh, occasions where I, I feel as if I've kind of overstepped the mark but uh, then people say you know well Sakari don't be too fussed because supposedly you know the power or whatever it is that you're insulting over in the delta actually doesn't travel across water yeah. we're in a different land here so um it's all been very interesting if i ever get some of my pieces back to nigeria you know it would be interesting to see what kind of chemistry is created because things have gone across to another place but it might just be that the power is, has left its place <laughs> it's different over there or something anyway life is complicated but you know uh, so I make choices what does success in the art world mean to you? success to me means being included so you know this thing of um, being a female and only showing in female shows um, I think you know why do that to yourself because other people are going to do that to you <laughs> you know, just try and plough for the top. Yeah. Um, so success to me is being included and being seen. And whenever you can be seen, it's a good thing because it means that you know, if you're a writer and um, as many people as possible could read your book, then you've really succeeded. And it's the same thing with a fine artist, I think. Yeah. The more you get seen, the better. If you could go back to 86 <laughs> after graduating <laughs> from the World College, what advice would you give to young Sakari then going forward with your career? I would say, yeah, I definitely would have pull her ear and <laughs> I'd say, you know, get to know this kind of profession that you're going after. Because I think um, most of my career I chose to ignore it. Yeah, you know, things got too heated. I'd just move, you know, because 
it's like having conversations with people that you don't want to have conversations with. And I think I should have been a lot more sort of aggressive and and um, spoken up a lot more. But you know, I'm an artist for a reason. I do that better than um, you know slamming people about whatever they're doing out there. So I, I'd say to her, give the market a chance. Yeah, get to know the market. Um, it's like, I think in colleges now, they, they tell you more about planning your career, which I think is a good thing. But I think they should emphasise more about actually making work because I think, you know, it's become so conceptual um, you've planned your career and then we've done it without doing it, do you? <laughs> so it's gone from one extreme to the other. So um, you have to keep an eye on things like that and really go for things that mean something to you uh, so that you can die happy. <laughs> so you've got to try and do that. And what about if she was graduating right now, what would you say to her? If she was graduating right now, actually she wouldn't be. She wouldn't be graduating right now. Why? Because I don't think she'd want to do art. Why? Uh, because people aren't doing art. They literally are not doing art. They're doing sort of business studies or something, <laughs> <laughs> so she wouldn't be graduating right now. <laughs> Because, you know, I think that, you know, there is a passion to my um, era that's just not around anymore. It's far more intellectual and mm. um, it's about thoughts rather than what's in your heart um, and any kind of, um, I don't know, there's no taboo breaking or whatever going on out there really either I mean yeah it's quite dull oh, sorry to say that <laughs> <laughs> it is you just think well, well terribly boring <laughs> stuff going on you know I mean when you go into a room and you're searching for work because there's it, the room is empty that's a bit worrying really because you know I like things for my eyes. I like food for my eyes. Yeah. I mean, I've seen uh, CBE, um, the Smithsonian, as you mentioned, uh, the British Museum. You've got lots and lots of huge achievements under your belt. Which would you say was the biggest and the most meaningful for you? And how did you achieve it? Biggest achievement? I don't know. I suppose, you know, um, my work opening the um, Smithsonian was quite a big deal. But it was so over my head, you know, I was, you know, carried there without anything on my part because I knew nothing about the art world, museum world or anything when that happened to me. So totally out of my control, so I can't really claim it. Mm. But it did happen to me, pinch, pinch, it did. <laughs> <laughs> but I can't claim it. Yeah, the greatest thing, oh, my children are. Oh. But that was kind of out of my control as well. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, uh, maybe I will have something else that happens. But, um, yes. I don't know. The memorial to Ken Sarawira is close to my heart. That was amazing. Yeah, it's very close to my heart. But it's going through an awful lot of turbulence trying to get it to Nigeria and free in Nigeria to be seen by people um, but you know people here are amazing people like um, Michael McMillan and um, John Daniel I think his name is because um, they used they did things like use the font from the bus to make um, other projects to make an actual font for a, a, another piece of work but inspired by the bus and produced by them and that was quite moving for me and then Michael McMillan doing a whole thing really saluting Ken Sarawira and mm. his work because I think he was inspired by Festac and 
Pekin and Nigeria. And it's just the kind of ripple effect of things that I've been connected with, exciting other artists is, you know, very uh, moving. But, you know, so moving, you can't go, wow! <laughs> you just think, oh, yeah. I, I, yeah, that's been my most touching stuff recently. Yeah, and the bus just continues to be this extraordinary thing that crosses cultures and is a little bit like me, caring about Nigeria but being very far away from it. Um, and then, you know, just being engaged with the world because, you know, the environment and um, the balance in the world has to be cared for. And even though Nigeria might ignore it, we're still part of this thing, which is the globe. You know, <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah, those are the kind of large things in my life, I suppose. Amazing, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. thank, thank you for you. your time. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back. Thanks for joining me for that edition of Art Success with Sakari Douglas Camp. If you'd like to know more about her and to check out her work, please do click the link below. That will take you directly to her website. And there you can keep up to date with all of her latest uh, work and exhibitions. To keep up to date with what I'm doing here on this channel, please do subscribe. I would just like to say thank you to everybody who has subscribed so far. I really do appreciate your support. If you like the video, please do hit the thumbs up. Until next time, take care. Bye. Thank you.